to shrink that. Okay, so one first thing, my disclaimer statement. So I repost this lecture for my online students, especially this semester, to help them out. Right? But then they get confused when you guys ask me questions about assignments and dates and theirs are different. So this is my disclaimer for them. Right? That this is from my face-to-face -face class and the dates do not apply to you. Right? This is for online students. For you guys in this class, obviously this applies to you. Right? Um, so there's my disclaimer. The next thing we're going to look at, which is the same for both online and face-to-face -face students, is reviewing your exams. So under exams, the first link there says reviewing exam results. So in order to do that, you must download the program you used in the computer lab called Respondus Lockdown Browser. You don't have to do that, but if you want to review your test at home, you do. Okay. Um, I give you the link. It's free to download, right? Our link. For each question on the exam, for the most part, the matching for some reason was giving me fits, but I think I figured out how to go in and add objectives for the next test. Um, each question is list to, list, linked to an objective, of course. So in the feedback section, when you see the question and you see your results, in the feedback section, I'll tell you what objective that was linked to, in case you couldn't figure it out. Those are what you need to study is the objectives, as I've said over and over again. And that's what I go over in my lectures. So here's an example of an objective that was on the test, right? Distinguish between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Which means you have to know similarities and differences in what each one is defined as. So here's an example of a question that may have been on test one, which it wasn't. Prokaryotes, right? Lack a membrane-bound nucleus. Right? The correct answer is C. That's the other thing, is you're going to see your results. It's going to tell you whether you got it right or wrong, and it's going to tell you what the correct answer is. After you take the exam, say you got that question wrong, right? And you see in the feedback, right, that it was on that objective. The question, though, focused more on prokaryotes, right? But if you knew the definition for prokaryote, you probably got it right. Or maybe if you knew the de definition for eukaryote, that may have helped you. On the final exam, I'm going to change it up. I'm not going to ask you the same question again, right? I'm going to ask it in a different way. So I could ask any one of these two questions. I could say, all prokaryote cells are smaller than eukaryotes. With true and false statements, when it says all, that should be like, eh, eh, oh. In science, that's like, it's like, it never happens, right? There's always an exception, <laughs> right? So this one's false, right? Everyone agree? Although most of them are, most, if it said most, then we would say true, right? Um, or I could ask um, something like this. And there was one question on the test, hopefully you guys didn't goof that, um, where you had to check two things, right? To check all that apply. There were two correct answers. Um, so for this one, we would check both A and C. So remember, this is the icon of what the program looks like. This is the link to download it. Um, the program is also on the computer lab up here on the second floor of Building 2. It's on all the computers in there. It's usually off to the right-hand side down at the bottom. It's a kind of all by itself even, the little um, icon for it on the desktop. As well as you guys already experienced, you went to the Hibernia Center. They have it in there. But as you saw, sometimes people reserve it like I did for our test. So sometimes it's not available. The good news is that's in building one, right? What else is in building one? That would be me, yes, my office. So if the Hibernia Center is got a class in there, what could you do? Swing around to my office and see if I'm there, because guess what? I have a computer in my office I'll let you use. It even has two monitors. Or you can download it at home, right? Make sure that if you're a Mac user that you download the Mac version. There's even the steps on how to do so, right? If you're not used to download, download, downloading stuff. Plus the other thing is if you're not used to doing stuff like that, right? Everything is on YouTube now. Like literally everything. <laughs> uh, so... 
The other thing that I, so as soon as possible, go review your test because it's available. It was available yesterday afternoon. How many of you guys got an announcement from me, a notification that the test had changed? And you're like, what does that mean? That's what it means. It means that now when you click on it, whether it be from your grades, I can report me now. I screwed up. Not on purpose, though. I can edit my recording. <laughs> Cut out that little section so no one can pause it and see someone's grade. So it's going to take me a little bit longer to post the recording from today. All right. So from your grades in my student view, you can click on it. But because I'm not in Lockdown Browser, it's not going to actually go to it when I click down here, click here to review results. It's probably going to tell me I need to open it in Lockdown Browser. It might actually go... No. Okay. So you have to have everything shut down on your computer. You open up Lockdown Browser just like we did for the test, right? So remember this icon, which you can download onto your computer. Where's mine? Right there. Right? Close everything down on your computer. Make sure you're, you're connected to the internet first, especially if you're using Wi-Fi, right? Then close everything down. Click on that. It'll go right to Canvas. You log in. Go right to your grades. Um, or click on the test within the modules. And it will go right to it. So in the modules, you could even click on the test itself link. But notice, as it says, it requires Respondus Lockdown. Right, so I just randomly quickly answered questions, by the way. So that's why I got a 29 out of 100. I literally just click, 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 click. So clearly not a good method, right, for taking a test. Um, so here you would click and it would show you the results. And again, for me, it's not going to because I'm not in Lockdown Browser. And Lockdown Browser shuts down everything else on your computer. So I can't record that because it won't let the recording program run at the same time. So um, I'm going to leave my student view now, and I'm actually going to go to the modules. And as an instructor, I'm going to click on the test. But I don't want you guys to see anything you're not supposed to, so I'm going to, which I already spied on my mm -hmm. online class. They were a 73. You guys were a 74, right, for an average. Highest grade was a 94, and the lowest was a 41. That can't be right, though, because mine should be in there. Maybe maybe because it's test student, it didn't put my 29 in there. Thank goodness. That would throw off our average, right? <laughs> but it gives me a breakdown of each question, right? And clearly this one was too easy, right? Um, but, you know, I can analyze my test and see if I need to make uh, changes uh, for the future. So as I said, I haven't, I literally have not clicked on it until just now. So I haven't had a chance to analyze where we're at and consider any changes I want to make for the final. So again, probably too easy. Yeah, in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure you really know it, right? Okay, so any other questions in, in, in regards to the test and what you need to do? Okay, so I'll have an assignment pretty soon that is called the agreement assignment. And before I want you to do that, I want you to review your test results. Um, so the instructions will say, look at your test results before completing this assignment. Because guess what? I'm going to ask you about your test results in the agreement assignment. You can't answer those questions unless you've actually reviewed your test. That, and to make sure that I know that you know how to get access to the program, you'll have to do that assignment using the Lockdown Browser. So either go to either one of the computer labs, my office, or download the program at home. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's in the instructions. Um, because you probably have something open on your thing or you're not connected to the, you think you're connected to the internet and you're not like what happened to me. Remember, first thing, especially if you're using Wi-Fi, make sure you're connected to the internet, right? Then close down your web browser, open lockdown browser, 
and then you should be able to log in. So yeah, the link is, of course, under reviewing exam results. Right? Right there. Cool beans? All right. So that should be the first thing that you do. And then, of course, I don't bombard you guys with announcements, so you should actually read them. Right? Or set it up so that you get them emailed to you or something to that effect. So you'll see that I already sent you an email that says you can now review or view your exam one results. See this page, I even gave you a link to it, the link to download the program. And then read chapter seven in preparation for tomorrow's lecture. And I was gonna try to post last night, but last night didn't happen. Does anybody understand what she's asking me? Because I don't. You're saying test one as it relates to the final. Because there was no word in there that said final. Okay. <laughs> right? I did not hear. Okay. Okay. Ah, I know it's early, but I did not understand anything you said. Okay. So your best way to study for the final exam is... Any of those objectives that were on the test one that you missed, make sure that you know it because there's a 50-50 chance that any objective on any test will show up on the final. So in other words, I think the answer to your question is no. Not every single objective from test one will be on the final. About 50%. Okay, no. 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 It's called reviewing your test. You write your own study guide. I can't write the study guide for you. I don't know how you did on your test. You got to go look at your test, right? Figure out which objectives you didn't know from test one so that if it shows up on the final, you don't get it wrong again. Yes? So you see why I can't actually write the study guide for you? Or uh, in other words, I'm not going to cut it down to 50%. I'm sorry. I'm not. It's open now. Yep. It is open now. It don't close. Don't delay. Because right now, right, is, is the key time. Because you remember the test, right? And you can go in and go, oh, I did it again like Ms. Burns said not to do. I changed my answer. I had the right one, and I changed it. Why did I do that? Right? Uh, yeah, I know. Y'all do this. I keep saying it, but you still do it. I don't know how to stop you. Right? We good? Okay, I knew this was going to take a lot of time. But it's important. You good, Lance? No? <laughs> All right. One more shop talk thing. <sighs> I do have my meeting tomorrow afternoon with the Wiley peeps, so hopefully I'll be better versed on these things. So I had several back and forth uh, communications with Wiley um, peeps. And so I posted this new document for you guys under Wiley Plus. Do this before you call tech support for Wiley because this will help you. Most of the issues that people have with Wiley Plus is from not clearing your cache or cookies on your computer. So this is links on how to do that, right? And turning off your lockdown or lock pop up blah, pop up blocker, right? So this is a link, right? And then it gives you all the choices for whatever browser you're using, right? Uh, this tells you how to clear your cache. Here's even an example of, of how to clear cookies. And then if all else fails, of course, connect contact tech support for Wiley. Make sense? So I think that were you trying to purchase and couldn't purchase? No, okay. So it was your cousin. So and there was someone else. I don't see him here today. 
And that was why it wasn't giving them the plus symbol, is because they need to clear their cache of cookies. Even though we tried to do it in the computer lab, apparently that's the worst place to do it because they never clear the cache of the cookies on those computers. <laughs> and of course, I had no idea what they were talking about. And now I have a better understanding. We good? Right? So I'm not afraid of technology, but I'm not saying I know it. <laughs> We're all learning together when it comes to certain things. So this is stuff that's stored on your computer, right? And it basically just pulls it back up, what it saw before. And so if you don't clear that out, you don't see what you're supposed to see. Does that make sense? I think that's the most simplest explanation I can make for caches and cookies. They, don't, they, don't, they sound appetizing, right? But they really aren't. <laughs> They're problems. Okay, so yes, I had not posted module two yet for you guys, um, but I did post what chapter we were going to be in today, and I think I'm not going to waste any more FaceTime with you guys, um, but promise that after I have lab today, which is from 11 to 2, or maybe even during the lab, I will post a module two for you guys. The problem with module two is that um, genetics is spread out between three chapters. So it's a little bit of a piecemeal for me, um, more so than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so I, w I do want to bring your guys' attention to the syllabus addendum. Because if I'm slow on the act, although I promise to be better, most of the questions you have about this course are answered in the syllabus. I need one of those t-shirts. It says read the syllabus. It's in the syllabus. Right? I put a lot of time and effort into this. Most teachers do. So where I am scrolling to is right here. It's actually, I think, like, like the last thing. Right? And so notice that genetics chapter 7 and 9, and I think that there's probably, maybe, I thought that maybe there might be one more. But you notice on the list I have viruses, then genetics, and then growth and control, and I probably should switch up my list. What I like to sometimes do, and look at viruses in two chapters too, <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Um, is genetics tends to be difficult, right? Especially if you don't have a strong base from biology which I, from what I've been informed recently, because I don't teach general biology here, I've never have, it's at the end of the course. So some instructors don't really get to it or don't cover it significantly. So how many of you guys feel confident when I say the word DNA and RNA and proteins, how it is that you get from each one? Yeah, exactly. So unfortunately, I have to spend time in this class going over some of the specifics that you need to understand in order for us to even talk about genetics and do it effectively. So chapter seven does a really good job at introducing it and I really like the way this author uh, introduces this topic. So chapter seven, which is where we'll start, And so, like I said, this is important, and this is even important as it relates to viruses. So you'll notice in this chapter at the end, they say, okay, now let's go back to viruses now. <laughs> let's talk more specific about viruses now that you understand about DNA and RNA and proteins and how that all happens. So how is it that DNA is replicated and how are genes expressed? So the chapter opener has this great picture right? But how many of you guys actually read the chapter opener? Yay, right? It's to open up the discussion on the information. It's a wonderful little vignette, right? It's there for a reason, y'all. It's not just fluff. Like, textbooks don't have fluff, right? It's not a magazine, right? <laughs> it's not an advertisement. <laughs> it's cool stuff, right? So read it, right? That's number one in your homework, right? If you skipped over it, go back and actually read that paragraph, because I'm going to talk about it. 
So the outline of this chapter is they talk about the role of DNA, which is good because it covers one of the objectives. And that's the other thing I'm not going to post today yet for you guys, although some of the objectives are here. The terminology they use in this book is slightly different from terminology I've used in the past, so I have to even modify my list of objectives so that you guys aren't confused. And I'm still in the process of literally, I find when I make those changes, I've got to do it one day and then the next day come back and look at it, right? Because your brain, you guys know about proofreading, right? You can't proofread right after you write it because you don't see the mistakes you've made. You need your brain to switch to something else and then you come back and you're like, oh, oh my God. How did I mess that up? <laughs> right? So you can't, you can't, you can't. And, and that's important too because that we're going to get into how the enzymes proofread DNA when they replicate it. And they literally do it right after they've made it. So are they always catch their own mistakes? No, just like us, right? Right after, too soon, you don't see it. You leave it. So, although they go into quite a bit of detail on replication, we're not. <laughs> right? This is not biology class. Right? I need you guys to know the <clears throat> basics to move on to the next levels. Same thing with transcription. Right? We're going to talk about the basics. But if you need those details to fill in the gaps, then you need to read these sections of your textbook. And you need to come see me or go see a tutor if you need help making it all make sense. We are going to spend the most time on translation. So that animation, for those of you guys that stuff moving and explaining is helpful, I would suggest watching that before next lecture. The main reason why we talk about genetics is as it relates to mutations. Right? That's why we're talking about DNA and RNA, because mistakes happen, and that's what mutations are. And so, how many of you guys are Facebookers? Okay. How many are nerdy Facebookers? You know what that means? That means that, like, the science stuff that pops up and all that stuff, you actually look at it. Okay, I got a whole bunch of them in my genetics class. They're awesome students. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm basically a nerdy Facebooker. Like, all my friends are scientists, for the most part, right? And so, you know, all the nerdy links show up on my site. But they're awesome. So there's one that I'm going to actually try and find the direct link for you guys so you don't have to be a Facebooker to get to it. Because I know it's out there in cyberspace. Literally showing mutation as it relates to antibiotics on a, at, I think it was Harvard, huge Petri dish, right? I see, she saw it, she saw it. She's got the nerdy links, right? Huge Petri dish, right? And they started the bacteria growing at either end with, with increasing concentrations of antibiotics. And as they replicated, they mutated, and they mutated such they were resistant to the antibiotics, so they kept growing all the way across the plate. You can literally see mutation in action. It was on Twitter too. So it's pretty cool. So I'll post the link for so all the rest of you guys that aren't in the nerd circle can get it. Because it's awesome. But not really awesome for us, right? What did I just say? Bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics. What we use to kill them. <laughs> Yeah, was it E. coli? Yeah. yeah. I, I was trying to listen to it without my husband knowing I was listening to it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to interfere with what he was doing. I, I was too lazy to get up and leave the room when I saw the link. So he gets annoyed when I play audio on my phone without my earbuds. He doesn't want to listen to my stuff. So. He does the same for me. He doesn't sit there next to me playing his videos usually. I don't want to know what he's watching. But we do share. Too. Shows me the funny, you know, animal videos. So we can learn from these things. So how do we know DNA is the molecule of heredity? How do we know this? Nowadays, we just know, right? Because you were in biology class and they told you, right? And they have it in your textbook. 
But how did the people before that, right, how did they know? How did they figure it out? What did they do? Ah, uh, yeah, you can't see the double helix in the microscope. Watson Crick was, what, 1950s? We didn't have, just barely had electron microscope. Thanks to Rosalind's work with uh, x-rays, they helped deduce the structure of DNA. But you're on the right path, right? So she did what? Rosalind did what? She was working in a lab. She did experiments. Imagine that. They did experiments. And they got data and results. And based on that, they came to conclusions about what is potentially happening, right? She, didn't get credit for it, right? she got credit now, but not back then. <laughs> That's a sore point for most scientists, right? Okay. So we know today that the process by which cells use heredital information is stored in DNA. The DNA must remain intact and yet be copied to make new copies for the new cells, right? We call this DNA replication. So in your own understanding from what you remember, what's the simplest way you could explain replication? I need a volunteer to raise their hand. Nayara, you want to? Okay, go ahead, Nayara. It's a copy of your genes. Okay, another explanation? Well, when the cell divides, they got to copy it, right? Okay. So they're copying it. How do they copy it? How many strands is DNA? Two, right? So it, it does split in half, right? And enzymes copy one strand into the new strand that are complementary. So we learned base pairing in biology, right? Of which nitrogenous bases go with what? I'm not going to test you on that in this class. You should already know it. But if you don't know it, what I'm going to talk about later, you're not going to get it. So we're going to talk a little bit about it and review a little bit about it, OK? It must be turned into multiple working copies in the form of RNA. So DNA actually doesn't do anything. It's just the stored information, right? It is actually the RNA that goes out and actually does something, right? So we have different forms of RNA, right? Can someone name a form of RNA? Raise your hand first. Lance. tRNA. What does T stand for? See the problem with these acronyms? Transfer. Yeah. What is it transferring? These are very simplistic definitions DNA, you right? should already know. Transferring through the DNA. It's transferring information. There's going to be a whole lot of people reading Chapter 7, right? Between now and Friday. Hmm? Say it again. Ah, she got it. It transfers amino acids. <laughs> so, this is one of those days where I need to like bring candy prizes or something. Okay. All right. That's just one of them. There's more. I need at least one more. M and RNA. What does the M stand for? Messenger. So in this case, it is carrying a message. To what molecular complex that actually reads that message? Yeah, RRNA, which is part of what? The ribosomes, right? The ribosomes that attach, right? And read that information, and the transfer RNAs transfer in the amino acids to build what molecules? Proteins. Right? So that actual process is known as translation. And I gave you guys some tips on this before, remember? I said how to remember transcription versus translation, right? Transcription, you're writing out a transcript. You're writing out messenger RNA, right, from DNA. And then you're changing languages, basically, or molecules in the case of this world. You're going from 
nucleic acid, which is RNA, to proteins, which is amino acids. Can someone please close the door because the outside people talking is really getting past my level of tolerance. And then the whole reason why we get to talk about all the other stuff before it is because we want to be able to talk about what they talk about at the end of the chapter, which is why mutations are good, bad, or indifferent, and what different types of mutations are out there. That's the stuff you need to know for this class. So I love the way, as I said, this, this chapter opens it up because they start with the fundamental experiments that answered some of these questions we've just been talking about. So who? I want to know if you know who, and you need to know, it's an objective, who this experiment led to the discovery of transformation, a process that we're going to talk about in this class. Griffith. Forgot his first name. I want to say it starts with an F. No, actually, um, I don't know what he was considered. Uh, I do know he was trying to develop a vaccine against streptococcus pneumoniae. And he saw that there were two different types of streptococcus pneumoniae. Some that grew smooth when he grew it out on agar plates, and others that had a more rough texture. And when he infected mice with these two different strains of the same species of bacteria, the smooth strain caused pneumonia in the mice and they died. The rough strain didn't kill them. So they're different, right? They're genetically different. And even when we look at their characteristics under the microscope, one has a capsule and one doesn't. Right? So the smooth one, the reason why they look smoother is because they have that capsule layer. But that's also something that makes them more pathogenic and why they can cause pneumonia and kill the mouse. So he was, he was playing around, literally, <laughs> trying out things and seeing what happens. And he found that if he combined the non-pathogenic rough strain with the pathogenic smooth strain, and he mixed them two together, he got something he wasn't expecting. So, again, he's trying to develop a vaccine, right? He's trying to give our bodies some prior knowledge about these pathogens so that when we come up against it, we can be better defended, maybe even immune. So he gave killed smooth strain, right? That's the pathogenic strain. And the mice survived, of course, because he killed the bacteria, right? He heated it up, he killed it. So the mouse survived, right, because it wasn't a live bacteria. But if he gave the live stuff, look at that poor mouse. <laughs> He's dead, right? It caused pneumonia and he died. He found the rough strain wasn't virulent, didn't cause disease, the mouse survived. So he's like, well, he survived and he survived, so it'll be even better if I mix these two things together, right? <laughs> yeah, no, because look at the mouse is dead. And, of course, when he autopsied out the mouse, right, so he put killed, smooth, and live, rough, in, the mouse dies, he gets back out live, smooth, and live, rough strain. What probably killed the mouse? <laughs> <laughs> no, he got pneumonia because somehow we ended up with live, smooth, strain bacteria. Now, did these dead guys, like... Did the live rough reactivate the killed smooth? I'll tell you, they didn't come back to life. They're not zombie bacteria, right? This is not walking dead bacteria. 
what happened is how is that smooth one know how to make that capsule? Where is that information? In its DNA. So some of these guys picked up the DNA from the dead guys. Right? They, they become, when you're dead, you, you, all your parts become part of the environment, right? So the live rough ones picked up some DNA from the smooth ones. And guess what they picked up? How to make a capsule. So then they started, the next generation started making capsules. And they're smooth. And they stick. And they avoid phagocytosis by our white blood cells. So they grow and multiply in the lungs to large numbers, cause pneumonia, and kill the mouse. So he said, okay, something, right, is coming from the dead ones that the live ones are picking up, right? Because, again, he was like, no, it's not walking dead. It's not zombie bacteria. They didn't come back to life, right? But what was it? It wasn't until the next scientist that you guys are going to read about for homework that they actually narrowed it down to DNA. And then the next set actually proved, right? Oh, yeah, it's DNA, right? That's the, the information storage for the cell. And, of course, there was some argument there because DNA isn't really all that complex, right? How many nucleotides are we talking about? The code is made up of how many letters? Four. Amino acids that make up proteins, how many different amino acids are there? Twenty. That's a lot of different combinations, right? How is it that DNA that has four, right, can give rise to all the variability of proteins that we see? It has to do with how we do translation, right? So review these things, right? Read most of this chapter. Watch the animation on translation if you need to, to help you out. I even embedded in this PowerPoint, which I will post the minute I get over to lab for you guys. This I will do. But remember, you have to be connected to the internet. You have to be in presentation mode. You can just go to the book, right? Everyone should have access to the book, right? Once you clear your cookies and your caches, you should be able to buy access to the book if you haven't done so yet.